All right, gang, here we go. So this is Chem 1, Unit 4, and we're going to be talking about chemical bonding in this unit. Uh, so we're just going to, this first part is really simple. We're just going to hit some high points, make sure we're all using the same vocabulary. All right, so there's two types of chemical bonds that we're going to worry about in this course, ionic bonds and covalent bonds. All right, T uh, take a minute and pause and just uh, write down all these things in your notes. Okay, just to hit a couple of the high points here in an ionic bond, when you get a form, formation of this bond, these electrons are being transferred one to the other. In a covalent bond, these guys are shared. All right, notice that these uh, covalent bonds occur when you have molecules, and this should sound really familiar. Okay, <clears throat> um, when you are forming an ionic bond, this happens between a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, so remember the metals are the ones on the left side of the periodic table. The non-metals are the ones on the right side of the periodic table. And remember we got that stair step that kind of separates the two. All right, um, covalent bonds happen between non-metals. All right, so those are the guys on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Now at room temperature, so we say we should maybe at room, room temperature, almost all ionic compounds are solids. Okay, but covalent compounds are solids, liquids, or gases. So it just kind of depends on what's uh, what's there and kind of how they interact with one another and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about more of that, more of that um, in a couple of uh, videos here. All right, ionic compounds usually have very, very high melting and boiling points, and covalent compounds are usually a lot lower than that. Okay, uh, so here's just kind of a way of looking at this. The formula unit of an ionic crystal, remember? So we had a formula unit versus a molecule. So this is kind of like what uh, an ionic crystal looks like, all right? Um, and so like depending on what you've connected, let, then this might actually be the smallest chunk, like these two things that are connected to one another. And then notice that they are also slightly bonded to the other things that are around it. And so this is kind of like a grouping of those formula units. All right, it forms like this crystalline shape. And this is part of the reason why it forms solids, because it, look, it makes this really nice, very stable thing. Um, whereas covalent compounds, really they're just kind of all out there by themselves, all by them lonesome. So this guy here you should recognize as water, because it's got one oxygen and two hydrogens. So you got an oxygen here and then two hydrogens that are connected to it. Okay, and so this would be one molecule of water, right? So you got the hydrogens and the oxygen, and then you might have other ones that are surrounding it, but notice that they're not really connected to it. We don't have to draw those in like we did with the ionic compound, okay? Uh, so th these little, these guys here that are connecting these two, that should, that those are the, uh, the electron pair that's being shared between those two guys. Okay, so remember, in an ionic compound, those electrons are transferred, right? The the cation will just literally give up its electrons to the anion, whereas in a molecular compound, they're actually being shared between the two. All right, so let's see if we can identify what type of bond occurs in the following. So essentially, we're asking, is it ionic or covalent? And essentially, and then from then, we're just asking ourselves, is there is it a metal with a nonmetal or just nonmetals combined? All right, uh, so chromium. So this would be uh, chromium oxide, it's like uh, chromium three oxide. Um, so anyway, uh, chromium is a metal, right? Because it's transition metal, it's element number 24. Okay, oxygen is a non-metal, so this guy would have to be ionic, all right? Uh, sulfur hexafluoride, all right? So we find S, S is a non-metal, it's number 16. Fluorine is non-metal, it's number nine. So this would also have, this guy would have to be covalent, all right? Uh, chlorine dioxide. Chlorine is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal, so this guy is also covalent. Okay, and then zinc iodide. So we find zinc, it's a transition metal, number 30. All right, and then we find iodine over there, it's a nonmetal, so this guy would have to be ionic. All right, pretty easy. Okay, uh, when atoms share electrons, that's called a covalent bond, right? So the atoms are sharing, it's called a covalent bond. Um, and then we make a molecule by combining all these different nonmetals, and they make a neutral group of atoms that are joined together by these covalent bonds. All right, that's, that's really what a, a molecule is. Now, this so remember, when we say neutral, we mean that it doesn't have a charge. Now, the tricky part is things like water. Okay, water is a polar molecule. You've probably already learned that when you talked about it in, um, in uh, biology or something like that. And you know that the oxygen end of this has like a negative charge to it, and water has a positive charge to it. So it's kind of, kind of this dual nature of like one side negative, one side positive, but it, those two sides cancel each other out. And as a whole, that molecule is neutral, all right? 
Now, the, there are seven diatomic molecules, and these are in bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. These seven guys always appear when they're in nature by themselves. They always appear in pairs. Okay, so like, for example, if you've been scuba diving, you know that you have your tank is labeled as O2. And it's not because there's twice as much oxygen. It's because the oxygen always comes in pairs because it's a diatom. Okay, diatomic two. Di means two and then atoms, right? Two atom molecules. All right. Now, the way to remember these is uh, Brinkelhoff. Okay, Brinkelhoff. You can totally just read it out. All right. Now, the trick is we get to spell it right. But um, so that's how I remember my seven diatomic molecules. All right. Uh, last thing here, we've got two different types of covalent formulas that you need to be aware of for this class. All right, uh, the molecular formula and then the structural formula. Molecular formulas indicate the number and type of atoms in a molecule. All right, so for butane right here, it's got four carbons and 10 hydrogens. That's what the little subscript four means and the little subscript 10 means. So four carbons, 10 hydrogens. Isobutane has the same four carbons, 10 hydrogens, all right? So you gotta be kind of careful with that because there are two different things. You have butane and isobutane, all right? So uh, so they have the same molecular formula. So in order to tell the difference, we use a structural formula. And this shows the actual arrangement of atoms and how they're actually connected to one another. So the structural formula for butane is four carbons and 10 hydrogens that are surrounding it. And isobutane is uh, four carbons, but they make kind of a, a T shaped for these carbons with the hydrogen surrounding it. All right, so notice that the molecular formula for both these things are exactly the same, but the structural formula tells you that these molecules are actually different from one another. All right, so pretty easy light unit here, and that's about it. So do your practice problems. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you in the next one.